Everyone turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 21. We're going to be picking up in verse 20 where we left off, but let's ask the Lord to bless this time of Bible study. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that we can come before you, we can turn to your word, and in so doing, we know that we will not leave disappointed. Lord, we know that within your word lives life itself. It's the bread of life. It's that which gives us instruction. That's what gives us the opportunity to come into and know you more. And Lord, in so doing, that what you have told us becomes a part of who we are. We ask these things in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. If you've been with us up to this point in time, we know that Jesus is just a few days away from the cross. We find him now going back and forth in and out of Jerusalem on a daily basis. And each night after he would spend the day in Jerusalem, he would retreat out to the area of the Mount of Olives. Jesus has just told those that are listening about the destruction to come that will happen upon the temple. And of course, this being overwhelming, this being something that is to the place of being unbelievable for them, the first question appropriately that they asked was, when is this going to happen? And what we see in Jesus' response is amazing. It contains both a near and a far prophetic application. Jesus is speaking of a time that will come upon the Jewish nation in which Jerusalem is going to be overrun. It's going to be completely destroyed. But he's also speaking about the end of the age, a time of his second coming. And in these next few verses, we're going to see both a historical account of the judgment coming upon Israel, but we're also going to see a judgment that will come upon the entire world in the time of what we know to be the Great Tribulation. As we move into chapter 21, verse 20, the first warning focuses on the nearer aspects of this prophecy. The Lord says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let, those who are, and, and let not those who are in the country enter her. This warning is very clear, and it's a warning coming from Jesus upon those that are into Jerusalem to heed a time that is coming when they're surrounded. Now we know that this is referring to, because it was to come in a few years after these words were spoken, A.D. 70, the entire siege, destruction, and overthrow of Jerusalem by the Roman Empire. Many Jews believed that there was no way that this could take place. As a matter of fact, they believed that Messiah would come at a time before this would take place and therefore defeat this hostile Gentile nation from overthrowing the kingdom of Jerusalem or Judah. For this reason, many were sealed to their fate and to destruction. But there was a group that was in Jerusalem that did heed this warning. There was a group that came together for prayer, and they were the Jewish Christians of the day. And the Jewish church of Christ, that those that were Christians and believers, were together and they were assembled at this time of the siege, they were right before the time that Rome entered in and completely sacked and destroyed the city, and they were having something along the lines of a prayer meeting. Now, can you imagine in times of peril that it would be okay for God's people to come together and sit and pray? Right? So it should be. I mean, in times when things are hard, how much more peril could you have than the city under siege about to be overthrown and the words of Christ saying that when this happens, when you see the city surrounded by these armies, get out. And this is exactly what happened. So as they prayed, they received a message from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit said, leave now. And then he gave them directions. He says, well, go ahead and leave. And you're going to leave by the eastern gate and you need to take everybody with you that you can. And so all of the Christians, almost all, decided that they would follow the instructions of the Lord, which is a good thing to do. And they made their way to the Eastern Gate. And, you know, they found something that was really amazing. And this is recorded not only in church history, but also in secular history, that when they got to the Eastern Gate, you know what they found? It was open. A gate to the city that's under siege was wide open and, and available for them to walk out there. You know the other thing they found? Nobody was guarding it. On either side. There was nothing. Can you imagine? What a coincidence that was. That as the church prayed and received inspiration and direction from the Holy Spirit, that He gave them and provided for them a way of escape from the city in order to be able to, if you will, comply with the very warnings of our Lord. 
The Jewish Christians were able to flee and therefore were spared this horrific destruction and slaughter that came to those who remained in Jerusalem. You see, because they listened to the warning, very few Christians perished at the time of this overthrow. And yet something so simple but imperative is found in this picture. Those who hear, those who heed, those who act upon the Word of God, receive salvation rather than destruction. And we know that destruction is certain. Destruction is coming to all of mankind, whether it's individual, on a national, or on a world scale. Judgment of the whole earth is going to take place, but yet God has made a way of escape. And it's not hard to see in our day and age how it is that so many people are heading willingly into destruction. But guys, it doesn't have to be this way. (laughs) It didn't have to be this way for God's people in Jerusalem, and it certainly doesn't have to be that way for people today. We've been warned by a loving God. Warned by a God to accept the salvation that comes through His Son. But we have to be willing to hear, to heed, and to act upon that warning. Verse 22 says, For these are the days of vengeance, all that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing baby and no, babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon the people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. When the Romans were done sacking Jerusalem, some 1.1 million Jews had been killed. Another 97,000 were taken into captivity. So complete was the destruction of Jerusalem at this time in AD 70 that the Romans, when they were done, not a single Jew remained in the city. Not a single Jew. As a matter of fact, they were prohibited from entering the city. The Romans renamed the city of Jerusalem, Ilea Capilina. No Jew was allowed to enter except for one time a year. They would allow those that were still outside the the city, they would allow them to come in one time a year on the anniversary of the fall of Jerusalem. Not in order to come to worship, but in order to come to mourn what it was that they lost. How great is that that the, the Romans were so generous to let them in at that one time so that they could point out the fact of what they had lost rather than being able to come and worship their God. It's hard to imagine how in such a short time that the Jews lost everything because they failed to follow the commands of their Lord. Jesus warned of these days of vengeance coming upon the people. And I believe that as he looked forward when he was descending down into Jerusalem just a few days prior when he rode into town and it says that he stopped and that he wept over Jerusalem, I believe the reason was not for its current condition, but because he saw this coming. He knew what was headed for the people that he loved and the city that he loved, that there would be this utter destruction because of their disobedience. And yet, still, there was a means of escape. And the same is true today. The same is true today. And it's going to continue until the time of the Lord's return. Because of His great love, God allowed Jesus to pour out His very life upon the cross of Calvary. His desire that none should perish, but that all would come to salvation. And the Jewish people, as they didn't have to suffer, nor does anybody have to suffer today, the suffering that we see, the misery that we see, the conditions that we see happening in this world don't have to be so. There needs only to be a hearing and a heeding and an acting upon the things of the Lord, of the Word of God, to act to receive Jesus Christ in order to have a way of escape. I think it's a tremendous message that we need to be sharing with all these folks that feel like there's no way out. There's no escape. How are we going to get out of these circumstances? How is this going to change? Guys, it's not going to happen through an election, and I really hope the election goes the way that we think it should. It's not going to happen through political change. It's not going to happen through appointments. It's not going to happen through all... That's not how it's going to happen. It's going to happen when the people of this Word hear, heed, and act upon the Word of God. That's what's going to change people's hearts, change their minds, and change the world. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, this time of the Gentiles where Jerusalem is trampled and controlled by other nations started in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. But understand, it continues till this present day. 
Now, you may have heard, and it may have been something that you grew up listening to or hearing taught, that there's this idea potentially that when Israel entered back into Jerusalem in 1967, that that somehow or another ended the control of the Gentiles or the trampling of Jerusalem. And guys, while this date represents an amazing fulfillment of prophecy concerning Israel, it still is not in any way, shape, or form leading to a point of Jerusalem not being controlled by Gentiles. In reality, Israel is in Jerusalem, but they don't control the Temple Mount. They don't have the ability to be able to worship or to make sacrifices on this, on this site. The Temple Mount, which is still occupied and controlled under Arab Muslim influence. They don't have control of the old city, the city itself being broken up into different quadrants. But when it comes to this occupation, when it comes to this idea, Israel, yes, is in the land. Israel is in Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is not free of the Gentiles. When we were in Jerusalem, it was interesting because we went up to the Temple Mount. And it's amazing. You go to the Western Wall, and everybody might be familiar with that, called the Wailing Wall. And that's where you always see the pictures, and people will, will be praying there. And the, 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 the Jews will, will pray, and they'll, they'll, they'll do their, what they call dubbing, which is, is, is going back and forth, and they'll spend all day there. There's a whole library there, and all of these people just praying continually. And any visitor that goes, got to go to the Western Wall. And I was there, and I loved it. They, they cause you to wear one of these little kippahs on your head, you know, so you got to cover your head and you go down and you pray. And there's just something amazing about the fact that this is the, the wall that supported the temple that was built there in Jerusalem. But then you go up this incline and you go up this set of, of, of ramps that leads all the way up to the top of the Temple Mount. And when you get on the top of the Temple Mount, when you walk through, the first thing that you notice is that it's not under the control of the Jews. Oh, now, militarily, yes, there is a military presence of the IDF there that maintains the peace. But when you walk up there, the first thing you do is you encounter this, this entry point that is manned by Arabs. And they want to inspect you. They want to make sure, number one, that you're not carrying any Bible or other holy book up upon the Temple Mount can't carry any scripture up there they want to make sure that you're properly dressed for the women they have to put on head coverings and they have to be completely covered and it was funny we had a bunch of young rambunctious youth that we took up there and some of the some of the male persuasion of the young rambunctious youth didn't want to wear pants and we told them you need to wear long pants oh no look at it shorts are okay you need to wear long pants oh no i'm going to wear shorts it's hot out there i'm going to wear shorts. you need to take some long pants. no the shorts are going to be fine okay so we get up to the Temple Mount, and the first thing that happens is, is that these Arabs look and they see these kids' knees, and they're like, no knees. You can't come in with your bare knees on the site. And so rather than wearing shorts and being all cool, they got to take a, a scarf and open it up. And we had to actually, I think, purchase some, some, some of these scarves that they had up there for the women, and they had to put them around like a sarong. They looked like they had dresses on while they were walking up there. It was wonderful. Now, you guys look really manly. But you get up there and there's these guys with white shirts and brown pants and they're scattered throughout the whole thing. And what you'll notice is if you walk up through there and as we were talking to to the group and trying to explain to them what was going on, these guys are walking behind you and they're walking and encircling you and just listening to what you're saying. And at one point in time, the instructor that was with us for that day was talking about it. It says in this place in the Bible and the guy walked over and says, you can't mention that here. You can't talk about the Bible. You can't cite Scripture in the Bible. And then at a certain point, we went over to what is Onan's threshing floor. It's called the Dome of the Spirits, and it's this area which would have been the the original site on the mountain of sacrifices and potentially Abraham's potential sacrifice. And then David bought the threshing floor. And this is the place where where all of it's happened, this incredible aspect of the Temple Mount. And the kids were all looking at it, and they were touching it, and they started to move on and move off to the side. And my wife, who was in the shadows, and she was kind of just waiting for everybody to move because she never gets involved in the mix. She's always behind the scenes, comes over, and she just wanted to touch the stone, touch the threshing floor. So she bent down, and she put her hand down. And the next thing you know, this very loud and what appeared to be angry Arab comes running out of a shack, yelling at her in Arab. I had no idea what he was saying. All I know is that he's yelling at my wife, and there's only one person on earth that gets to yell at my wife. And I'm even careful. 
And so I re-engaged, I engaged, and I set a path to cut him off because he was coming here and she was here, and I'm going on an angle to cut him off, and I'm going, hey, quit yelling at my wife, and he yell louder, and I yell louder, and we're, we're headed for it, man. We are about ready to start an international incident right on top of the Temple Mount. Salo, short for Solomon, our tour guide, comes walking over. Actually, he came over on a dead run. Puts his arm around my shoulder and says, let's not do this today. I thought, well, then that means there'll be a day that we will do this, right? But let's not do this today. So he starts, and they're just having normal conversation. Sounds like they're shout, it's a shouting match, and that's how that conversation happens in those languages. And he's yelling back and forth, and the guy's yelling at him, and he's yelling at him. And in the meantime, he just goes, take your wife, take your wife and go join the rest of the thing. I can take him. <laughs> not today. So see, it's not free. It, the, the Jews don't have possession of that because they can't go up there and worship. They can't go up there and sacrifice. When you go to the city, again, there's four sections. There's a Jewish quarter. There's the Muslim quarter, which is larger than the Jewish quarter and has more population. There's an Armenian quarter, which is really only a sixth of the size of the rest of the sections. And then there's a Christian quarter, which is where all the tourists go. It's where all the Americans go and, and the, the Christians throughout the entire world because it's supposedly the places where they've identified where Christ was, was crucified and buried and resurrected. And so all of the, 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 the huge churches and the huge mausoleums and all these things that would be a celebration of the things of Christianity to go back to the time of Constantine and beyond are all these, these big shrines. But to say that somehow or another that Jerusalem is no longer or somehow in 1967 came out from underneath this aspect of occupation and being trodden under by the Gentile has not happened. They're still the Gentiles controlling that area. So the question becomes is, well, when is this going to take place and what is it going to look like when it does? When the time of the Gentiles is done, when is that going to happen? We're told in Revelation that God's particular dealings with Israel are going to begin again. See, God right now has got Israel in kind of a timeout. He's dealing with us. He's dealing with the Gentiles. He's dealing with the church of Jesus Christ who is coming and being engrafted in. But a time will come when he'll turn his attention and his focus directly back upon Israel. And that's going to happen at the time of the Great Tribulation. It's going to happen in the end days. The time of Jacob's trouble is what we see it referred to of in, in prophecy. And the calamities that we now see in these following verses will come during this period. It says in verse 25, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, and the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing from them from the fear and expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven will be shaken, and then you will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. We know these events didn't happen in the near prophetic. Didn't happen in or around or after AD 70 in any kind of way that would have caused them to have been already completed. So that means that we must be looking at a futuristic completion of this prophecy. And that's exactly what's taking place because Jesus has turned from describing what would involve the day of vengeance upon Jerusalem, which took place, into now that which is going to happen at the time of his return or shortly before. Jesus is describing the events of the Great Tribulation. And we see this in great and horrific detail given to us in Revelation chapter 6 and 9 and chapters 15 and 18, where we see the description of exactly what's going to take place as the wrath of God is poured out upon the world. And it all comes to a climax and a dramatic and spectacular end when Jesus Christ himself returns in his second coming. And when he comes, his church will be with him. And while Jesus will come in the air, on the clouds, I mean, it's interesting because we've got this picture in our mind. And I know I've, all, I've we had it. We've seen pictures and artists will, will do renderings of Jesus splitting the clouds. And you see him coming through the clouds, right? And, and, and it's always from this side up. But the reality is, is if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you won't see it from down up. You'll see it from up down. 
Because we're going to be coming with him. And this aspect of this cloud that Jesus is coming in, I believe that there's room for us to, to be able to say, well, that cloud may be a cumulus cloud. It may be the clouds that we see in the sky, but I believe that it's going to be a cloud of the witnesses that are going to come with him to rule and to reign as he comes to establish his millennial kingdom. You see, how, how amazing is it to think that we're going to be those that are going to be coming with him, not standing and looking for him because we'll be with him, but yet there will be those that will be looking for him. And it says, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. This is where we have to keep timing in mind in order to be able to understand what this is saying. Jesus has been talking about two distinct time frames. He has talked about the destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70, and he's now talking about the time of the Great Tribulation. So we have to be careful not to insert the church, believers, Christians, into these events. Prior to the last seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation, guys, we're going to be raptured out of here. We're going to be taken out. We're going to be caught up, and we're going to go to be with the Lord. So Jesus' warning here is not for us. We're not the ones that are to look up to see him coming because we're not going to have a chance to look up. When he says, come up here, we're going up there. It's not going to be like, well, gee, I wonder what that is. What could that possibly be? And it's not going to be a slow ascent. He says that we're going to be snatched off the face of the planet. We're going to be caught up. I can't wait. I can't wait to see how it's going to play out, how it's going to work in relationship to this aspect of being pulled up and be brought up. It's going to happen so fast that the things that we don't need, the things that were, that were temporal are going to be left behind. And this is what's going to show up in this rapture, trunk and treat, right? Beth Kelly was here this morning and she said, yeah, and I said, I think somebody's got that. And she said, I got it! So she's already down. But think for just a moment. Your clothes, not going to need them. Glorified body, which means anything that you've added to your body, stays. Right? Tattoos, piercings, anything that didn't belong, anything that God didn't give you when you, when, when you was born ain't going with you. And now a new body is going, which means that if you've got knees and hips, they're staying too because the new stuff's going to be attached to you as you go up. <laughs> So think about this for a minute. What's it going to look like when people go, oh, oh, oh. Man. I don't think it's going to hurt. But all of that stuff's going to be left behind. Because as we go to be with the Lord, we're going to be transformed and our bodies are going to be made like His resurrected body, a body that's suited for heaven. A body that can stand in the presence of Christ and stand in the presence of an almighty Father God and do so in such a way that we are able to to enjoy his presence what a blessing what a thought and so when we look at this when we see what's happening here we need to understand that jesus is not talking to us he's talking to those who remain and he's saying when you see these things happen you need to look up because your redemption draws near and it's interesting because we know that if god would not have shortened this period of wrath to the seven-year tribulation period that no flesh would survive no one, all flesh would be completely consumed. But because of his grace, those that are left are going to know that there's an opportunity for this to end because the presence of Christ is soon to come. And look at what it says. Jesus now goes into a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees when they're already budding and you see and know for yourself that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Jesus loved using parables because parables work for people to be able to gain understanding. He says, let me tell you how obvious this is going to be. It's, it's obvious. How many of you have gotten to the place to where you believe that you're pretty good and, and grasp the obvious pretty well? Right? I'm a great, I mean, I can grasp things that are really obvious, right? But then it's amazing how many people can't. He says, when you see a tree budding, you know that summer is near. If you look at a tree and it's got buds on it, it's obvious summer is coming. It's obvious that what's following the buds is fruit. It's inevitable. 
And so the same thing is true when you see these things happening, that it's inevitable that Jesus Christ is returning in His glory and bringing the church with Him. It's obvious. He's given them hope. And it brings up an interesting aspect of our waiting upon the Lord. And I really was thinking about this a lot as I prepared this message because I have a tendency, like so many of you do, to want to know when. Wouldn't it be great if God would just tell us when Jesus is coming for us? Thursday. That means that we would get everything right by Wednesday at midnight. Yeah, yeah, not Thursday. That doesn't work. I'm golfing on Thursdays. That doesn't work. No, if we were told, when, and, and we know that that's not the case, we know that we're not going to be told when it is that Jesus Christ is going to return for us, but we do know that after He returns for us and calls His church out, that the clock starts ticking. Amen. That there is a prophetical and an actual seven-year clock that's going to start running, that's going to wind down to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So for those that are here, they're going to know. They have something to look forward to, to look to the sky and knowing that Jesus Christ is going to return. What I do know when it comes to our condition and our situation is I recognize through great hours of prayer, meditation, and searching the Scriptures that the return of Jesus Christ is closer today than it was yesterday. (laughs) And if the Lord chooses to wait... It'll be closer tomorrow than it is today. That's pretty prophetic, isn't it? Thank you, Captain Obvious. Okay? I mean, but for us, those who have found ourselves in the place of calling Jesus Christ Lord, those who have been saved and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, we're not going to be those looking for this to happen. When it happens, it's going to happen. And we're going to go to be with Him. So the question is, is what do we do in the meantime then? We're not going to be those that are hanging out, looking, waiting, hoping, watching. Oh, now we're supposed to watch. We're supposed to know the signs of the times. We're supposed to realize and recognize. And has anybody noticed that things aren't getting better? But the opportunity for better still exists. You see, what we're supposed to be doing right now is we're supposed to be those that recognize the fact that things are headed towards this. We've been warned by Jesus. We've been warned by the Word of God that these things are going to take place. And we've also been told that we have a specific mission. Tell everybody we can. Tell those that will listen twice and those that won't three times. We need to tell everybody about the gospel and the salvation message of Jesus Christ because that's the only means by which escape will come from what is happening and what is about to happen in the world. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till these things take place. Now, this is also another place in Scripture where depending on what your background is and what you've heard and and, and what has been taught, it's very easy for this to be misunderstood. If we make a wrong application in the time frame and take it out of context, we can create a different scenario. Jesus is not referring to his own generation, nor is he referring to the generation of his disciples. Jesus is referring to the generation that will see these signs. The same generation that will see the end of the tribulation period and the coming of Jesus Christ. See, because it's going to happen in a seven-year time frame. And God has promised, again, to shorten these days, lest all flesh be destroyed. But a problem can arise when we take this word jenna out of the Greek, this word for generation, and we try to make it fit a different time frame or a different application. This word can have several meanings. First, it can mean the descendants of a common people or a common ancestor. What this means is that the people of God the Jews will remain a people as long as God chooses it to be so. And he said that they will be a people until the end. And guess what? No matter what efforts have happened by those that have looked to create the Jews and cause them to be extinct, it hasn't succeeded within and throughout all of history. And it won't succeed because God has said that he's going to deal with his people, Jews, Israel, again. Then there's also this aspect, and this is how we commonly use it, 
Generation means those that were born in a similar or same time frame. How many of you in here think that you know, we're, we're kind of all of the same generation in here for the most part? Yeah, pretty close. Yeah, we're, we're, we're in there. Yeah, my wife's much younger than I am. She's in, no, she, <laughs> she is. She's younger. She is younger. And this is a common way of looking. This is where that, 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 that issue comes in. If we take it out of context and we talk about things that, that, that are inserting the church into a place where Jesus is talking about these two distinct time frames, and, and we do so, there's those that have looked at this and said, well, if the Jews were, were back in the, the land of Israel in, in 1967, and that's the end of the time of the Gentiles, then in a generation, Jesus is coming back. Well, if we assign 70 or 80 years to a generation, it, the time's really getting short. If that's the way that we want to try to frame this, but we frame it that way, then we're not staying contextually true to what the Scripture says. So we need to be careful. We don't know the day or the hour or when it's going to happen. Only the Father in heaven, not even the Son nor the angels, knows when it's going to happen. So it's not that we're supposed to be at, in any way, shape, or form not aware of what's happening, but we're not supposed to try to use this as some sort of cosmic timeline to figure out when Jesus is coming back. Jesus will come back when God tells him to. When the Father says go, Jesus will, Jesus will respond and he'll tell us, come up here, and guess what? We're going. Then we know that the prophetic timeline starts. When is that going to happen? I don't know. I don't know, and I'm not going to try to assign it a time frame. I'm not going to try to say, because if I assign it a time frame, again, what I'll do is I'll act differently until I believe that that time is upon me. When Jesus says, I don't want you to be, I want you to just occupy. I want you to be part of what I have called you to do. I want you, as long as you're there, as long as you're there, be a good and a wise and a profitable servant and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The key to understanding, again, is context. Jesus is speaking of those who will see the end times and what is going to happen during the seven-year great tribulation period. In that context, the aspect of this generation not passing away makes perfect sense. And it aligns with what Scripture says. But heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Just the other night, and they all start running together, so I don't remember if it was last Sunday or Wednesday. I think it was Wednesday night when I, I came across a section in Scripture where God basically said, I swear by me. I love that. I swear by me. I swear by myself. See, we can't do that. There's no man on earth that can take and say anything that would validate a word in this sense by virtue of saying, I swear by me. But see, Jesus here in this exact thing, he says, my words, my words will by no means pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. But what I just said, you can stand on for all of eternity. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on those who dwell on the face of the earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things which will come to pass and to stand before the Son of God. Here's where I believe that we can draw a a, a direct application, if you will, to our lives. The coming of Jesus has two distinct aspects. The return of Christ. They're separated at least by a seven-year period. The first is when Jesus calls us out as His church. The rapture. Jesus is coming, but He's not going to come back and touch foot on the planet. He's not going to touch His foot to the earth. That's reserved for another time. So he's going to call us up, and it just says that he's going to call, and he's going to say, come up here, and we are going to meet him in the air. I don't know what the visibility of that is going to be. I don't know that that's a, you know, we know that that, that we're, we're all going to go, and it's going to leave a heck of a mess behind. And then the clock starts. And the next leads up to the end of the seven year tribulation period when Jesus Christ returns. Oh, that's when the whole world will see him coming on the clouds and with the clouds of witnesses. And that's when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And that's when Jesus is saying, that's when you need to look up. That's when you need to pay attention because your redemption is drawing near at that point in time. 
end times prophecy is being fulfilled all around us. It is. And we need to be those who are informed. We need to understand. We need to be able to read the signs. We need to know that this is happening, but not for the purposes of drawing us to a place of fear or a place of being terrified or a place of being perplexed or, or, or being di- disheveled. That's not the point. The point is, is it's calling us to a place of action. It's calling us to a place of purpose. The idea is is that because we know that the time is short, then we should look at everyone who is yet to receive Jesus Christ as those that are going to perish eternally. And it gives us a purpose. And it gives us a meaning. Oh, you know, it's, it's it's hard to be extremely excited about things that look so harmful and damaging. But you know what? It should be an excitement within our lives of knowing that for those who will, anyone that will can receive salvation and escape that which is to come. Anyone that will, anyone that will choose, and and we are the ones that are to promote that. We're the ones that are supposed to encourage. We're the ones that are supposed to plead, if you will. And as the Apostle Paul said, he said, I'll even beg you to listen and to receive and to understand that there's only one means of escape. There's only one way by which salvation is received. And if you choose to refuse, God will honor your decision. He won't force it on you. God doesn't send anybody to hell. He lets them have their own way, and He honors their choice to go all on their own. And in the daytime, He was teaching in the temple. But at night, He went out, and He stayed on the mountain called Olivet. Then early in the morning, all the people came to Him in the temple to hear Him. Wouldn't it have been amazing? Can you imagine the excitement, the turmoil? The noise, just the calamity of the whole thing when Jesus would come in. Can you imagine the fear on the face of the religious leaders knowing that they had tried time and time again to put him down and couldn't? And now he just walks in and out of the city with impunity. Can you imagine how it's infuriated them? Man, this guy's doing things that we don't like. And so we're going to try to do everything we can. Can you imagine the ridicule and the lies and the deception? And yet Jesus walks in and says that the people came early every day. They went to church every day to listen to Jesus teach. And so the question becomes one that's very simple, based on a simple set of facts. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. Oh, he'll come back first for his church, but then he's going to step foot and he's going to establish rule and reign on this earth. And when he does at that particular point in time will be the time when all men are judged. There'll be a judgment that'll take place. Oh, for those who have already received salvation, that salvation is complete. For those that are on the earth, they're going to have an option. They're going to have a choice. They're either going to choose to comply. They're going to choose to follow the commands of the Lord or they're going to live in a way that's going to bring them to the place of destruction in the end question is are you counted worthy to escape are you worthy oh believe me it's not based on anything that you bring it's only based on what christ brings the worthiness that we have to escape is based on our willingness to accept to hear to heed and to act upon the word of god and the son his son jesus christ if you'll hear if you'll heed and if you act then that makes you worthy to escape. And I love the idea of escaping the wrath that is to come. Don't you? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you. And Lord, may it be that if there is anyone here today that has yet to choose, yet to plan their escape from the devastation and the destruction that is to come, then today let it be the day that they would accept your terms. Lord, it is truly just a matter of accepting the provisions that you have made. Lord, it's not a matter of cleaning up our act. It's not a matter of us doing really anything other than accepting your terms. We have to be willing to hear it. We have to be willing to heed it, to follow it, to accept it, and then, Lord, by action, apply it to our lives. And it happens by faith. As we place our faith in the Son of God, as we place our faith in the only salvation known to mankind, Jesus Christ. And Lord, when we do, (laughs) oh Lord, you secure us, you seal us in salvation for all of eternity. 
and you call us out, making us worthy of escape. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. 